being fat or skinny is a choice. Agreeers? Disagreeers? Oh boy, this is gonna be spicy. Hey everyone, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. Today I'm going to be throwing down some hot takes on obesity, jumping off of the super controversial yet super fascinating panel discussion on the Jubilee series, Middle Ground. A quick note that I am barely scratching the surface on this episode. I highly recommend you watch the whole thing in its entirety and check your beliefs and listen to the perspectives of those with different life experiences. For that reason, I ask that we keep the comment section here supportive. I am learning just as much as you are, so I encourage you to have an open mind and heart. My comments here are not to downplay the risks associated with obesity, but rather to apply the research that we have in this field to better understand the best and the worst ways to support change. Also, if you are not already, please subscribe to this channel for more evidence-based content and hit up my description for my free Hunger Crushing Combo ebook. But let me hop in here super quick to tell you about my sponsor, Audible. So I am a multitasking queen. So whenever I'm driving my kids to school or walking on the treadmill, cooking dinner, or running an errand, I've always got my earbuds in trying to learn something new. And I'm obsessed with my Audible subscription because they offer an amazing selection of audiobooks, podcasts, and originals across every genre, from thrillers to music to business, romance, and of course, wellness and health. Basically, how Audible works is that members get to choose one title a month to keep from their entire catalog, including bestsellers and new releases. You also get access to a huge selection of audiobooks, Audible originals, and podcasts, which you can download as much as you want. As an anti-diet dietitian and mama too, I have been listening to Fat Talk by Virginia Soul Smith, which is a really great story about parenting in the age of diet culture. Even if you're not a parent, I think this is a really great thought piece for understanding generational diet culture and how we can reduce the risks for our next generation. Audible also offers the OG intuitive eating title in their roster. So if you guys are new here, this is a really great way to make your way through this essential resource. But if one of your resolutions this year is to learn new things or indulge in more storytelling, check out my link in the description. New members get to try Audible for free, so check out audible.com slash Abby Sharp or text Abby Sharp to 500, 500 to try Audible for free. Okay, so big question here. Is being fat or skinny a choice? Here are some highlights from the majority knows. Then I felt like once it reached a point where I was old enough to try to make my own choices, I made all of the wrong choices. I wasn't eating and I was only eating like grapes and lettuce and that was mainly because I was in a sport and that sport just worked me out so hard. And it was to the point where I just was scared to eat. I, I didn't like it. I would only drink water. When that you were was... eating grapes and lettuce, were you thin? I was the thinnest I could be. Were you still big I though? Not, I was still big. As a disabled woman, I can't do a lot of the things that people say calories in, calories out. There's a thing called set points. There's a ton of research on it that your body likes to be at specific yep. weights. But I don't think skinny people not go all into people. this junk food aisle. They I think certainly yes, do. They do. They eat a lot of junk food. Yeah. <laughs> As you can see, for a lot of these folks, being the weight that they are does not feel like a 100% choice. As one pointed out, there is something called set point or settling point weight theory, which is actually something that I've talked about in my video right here. But basically, set point theory suggests that our body's weight is kind of like a thermostat, where there's a passive feedback system in place between the size of our body stores and our energy expenditure. So our body naturally prefers a body weight range, and it's suggested that it's not terribly hard to move within that range, but to get outside of it and stay outside of it can be a huge feat. And that's because our body fights back with a range of compensatory mechanisms like reducing NEAT or subconscious movement, increasing our hunger hormones, and downregulating our metabolism. Our set point range is largely related to genetics, which actually accounts for about 40 to 70% of obesity risk, and also the state of our gut microbiome, which may be only partially within our control. So for example, little things like being born via C-section or being fed formula over breast milk can slightly increase your risk of being an obese adult. 
Obviously, fed is best and all births are miraculous. So this is not any kind of judgment from me, but the science does show us that these early and pre-birth experiences can potentially affect our gut microbiome and how well we metabolize and utilize calories, all of which we covered in great detail in my video right here. Ditto with your mom's diet and weight gain rate while she was pregnant with you. And like, you're not even born yet, so you can't do shit about that. And again, I don't share this research to scare moms or shame them for their choices. These are very small factors in a very big picture to consider. So please like do not freak out. I'm freaking out, man. But I'm just trying to make a point here that obviously how you are born and how that sets you up for weight gain is not actually your choice. Ditto with certain medications, like someone with Crohn's didn't choose to have Crohn's and require steroids that make them gain weight. So as Mariah describes, when all of these uncontrollable factors are stacked against you, possibly before you're even born, some people will try to live off grapes and lettuce and still will not be thin. They will likely be thinner than had they made the choice to like eat McDonald's all day, but they still might not look like I would if I ate only grapes. But let's take a look at some of the arguments suggesting that obesity is in fact a choice. Even with the genetics that cause you to want to eat more, the same solution is calories in, calories out. In most cases for most people, being skinny or being fat um, is about willpower. It's about um, the environment you grow up in, sure, but who you choose to associate with, what sort of things you choose to listen to, who you choose to kind of have as your friends around you and support you. All of those things are choices that you can make. I do see an endocrinologist and I go see a doctor. It's a choice mm -hmm. to do the requisite steps. It's a choice to go grocery shopping instead of going to fast food when mm -hmm. it's easy. It's a choice when you're grocery shopping to go to the outer aisles and like not go into the bread section and not go into the junk food section. These are all choices. Choices. Yes, in the simplest terms, one could say that even if you consider genetics, weight comes down to calories. And it's your choice how many calories you consume. But as I discussed in my video right here, calories in versus calories out is actually not always a precise science. A calorie to you is not necessarily a calorie to me based on our gut microbiome. So it's actually more accurate to say that weight loss comes down to a calorie deficit. And even though achieving said deficit will be easier or harder for specific people based on genetics, microbiome, and a bunch of circumstances that I'm about to discuss, you still do need a calorie deficit to lose weight. That is just science. Yes, science! As for these sentiments around choice, while all of us living in first world countries have free will and autonomy, that doesn't necessarily mean free and open choice. These choices that the Lauren girl in red is speaking of cost money, they require health literacy, time off work, or physical access in close proximity to nutritious food. And these barriers are what often contribute to what is often called an obesogenic environment, aka a system that makes gaining weight easy and losing weight hard. Later on in the episode, they talk a little bit about food deserts. And it was very clear that a lot of people who live in cities within walking distance to a Trader Joe's actually can't fathom being in an environment with no public transit system and only like a gas station with chips and candy within a 30 minute drive. And when this was pointed out, Lauren, for example, was like, well, what's the problem with having to drive 30 to 45 minutes for groceries every week? And you know what, to me or her, that probably doesn't seem like a really big deal. But if you're a single mom with three kids and no childcare, working three minimum wage jobs, trying to carefully plan a whole week's menu to ensure that you buy the perfect amount of food so you don't need to make another trip, but you also don't let that food go bad and you stay within your budget, that could be a huge mental task. I mean, I remember trying to do this with my one weekly grocery pickup slot in early COVID days and the mental load was crushing. Like I had to be hyper organized and that took a lot of time and nutrition and food literacy that a lot of people just don't have. Where I stand on this question is probably closer to what Dominic says here. It's important to note, note that a choice can be harder for people to make due to conditions in their life. Yes. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's still a choice. I think 
Dominic does downplay just how prohibitive some of these conditions may be for some. So like, for someone like me, making a healthy choice could mean getting out of bed 30 minutes earlier to hit the gym instead of scrolling on TikTok. But for another person, it could mean losing the job that they need to provide for their family or working an extra job and never seeing their family. I'm not sure that that would be a choice that I could make. But yes, sure, in simplest terms, it's technically a choice to buy a $5 head of kale instead of a Happy Meal. But A, having access to those choices for some may truly feel out of reach, and B, based on people's genetically determined starting point, eating kale or a Happy Meal will change people's bodies to varying and inequitable amounts. In other words, kale alone might make you skinnier, but not necessarily skinny. There were also some interesting arguments made about the role the media plays in contributing to this obesogenic environment. And again, our girl Lauren had some hot takes. And they're encouraging it with media. There's a the, uh, <laughs> difference between the people who are telling people go out and get fat versus a Lizzo who's fat. saying accept yeah. me the way I am. And then saying if you don't think that it's normal for a morbidly obese person to be wearing a G-string in the middle of public, then you're the problem. But There's what's the difference ago. between a obese person walking around in a G-string or a bathing suit and a skinny person? I don't think mm. that we as a society should be modeling obesity. So, but I'm not modeling obesity, I'm modeling the lingerie that obese people need to be able to have availability to buy. This conversation about Lizzo promoting obesity just by existing in a larger body and not hating herself for it or hiding really reminds me of the dangers of oversimplifying the human experience. You know, sometimes two things can be true. You can know that your health or your life may be better if you were smaller, or even desire weight loss or desire being in a smaller body. And you can also love yourself and be confident in the body that you do have. Being a plus size model or celebrity, like just existing in this world and maintaining confidence in who you are as a person and your talent regardless of what your body looks like, can occur without an implicit or explicit promotion of that body. Like that's all what body positivity is about. It's not like, hey, look at me, I'm obese and you should want to be obese too. All you gotta do is stop eating broccoli and start eating bacon. No, like that is such a distraction from the actual social health and wellness issues that we have going on here. I talked a lot about this in more detail in my video on Lizzo right here, but Lizzo never asked to be the poster child of body positivity. It was just kind of put on her simply because she exists in a larger body and unlike a lot of fat people, she isn't hating herself for it. She's not hiding. But if you remember from that whole Lizzo juice cleanse debacle, two things can be true. She can love and respect her body and exist in this world showcasing her amazing talent and she can acknowledge that perhaps her life would be easier if she were thinner. There are 170 million overweight and obese adults in America. No one except some perverse fringe characters would actually be telling people, hey, stop being thin, be obese instead. And even if they did, are we really concerned that people would follow this gospel knowing how much society hates fatness? I'm not worried. I mean, based on my critical evaluation of the media messages I see online, I would argue that recommendations from folks on the other end of the weight spectrum are way more dangerous. Even when it comes to overeating or eating a ton of unhealthy foods a la the mukbang trend or eating challenges, most of these videos are coming from small body creators. I mean, remember the time that I analyzed the comment section of Always Hungry and Amberlynn Reed's mukbang videos? So interesting that thin people are celebrated for binging on massive amounts of party-sized pizzas and wings and brownie sundaes in one meal, but fat people are called pathetic. So yeah, let it be clear that the visible existence of fat people in ads, on TV, in music, in movies, is in no way encouraging people to go out and eat more McDonald's. For every how to get fat I've seen, which to be clear, I'm not really sure I've seen any, I have surely seen a thousand how to get sickly skinny. So to me, Lauren is literally saying that Lizzo should be robbed of sharing her God-given talent just because she is fat. Do we not punish fat people enough? Moving on.
So I do agree that fat shaming is worse than skinny shaming. My favorite comment is always, I look like a uh, sickly ill Victorian child. Mm. And That's horrible. Th this idea that skinny people can't also get these kind of comments, mm -hmm. it's just kind of mind blowing. That doesn't mean that they're, you know, that one side is getting it worse than the other. I think that there are both sides being piled on just at different varying degrees. I come from cultures where they straight out called out skinny people. You look like bones, oh flaca, all like all of that. So I watched my cousins go through it. I went through it when I would get too skinny. As people, we are just too scrutinized when it comes to our bodies. We don't let people live. So people using shame as a motivator to get your cousin to not be too skinny. Shame as a motivator is a powerful tool. So the reason I sit over there is fat shaming worse than skinny shaming. Well, you could argue that shame shaming somebody in order to motivate them towards a healthy lifestyle is actually a good thing. If you watch TLC, you watch My 600 Pound Life, a, a Thousand Pound <laughs> Sisters, Family by the Ton, all of them can do it. Oh, I have watched those like as a younger person and it would make me feel disgusted with me when I was a kid so it would make me worse and it made my mental health worse because then I'm like is that how like everybody automatically views me as just like somebody who's oversized and could possibly never even attain it because it's so just Wait. Common. Super interesting discussion on shame here. And here's my take based on the research. First of all, any body shaming feels terrible. And while fat shaming certainly is more prevalent and pervasive than skinny shaming, like criticizing someone's body is abhorrent and should not be tolerated regardless of which end of the spectrum it comes from. As to the question of whether shame can be a positive motivation tool, I respectfully disagree on a population scale. Of course, there will always be people who can transform negative feedback and criticism into motivation to change their habits. But even if it works for some people and they go on to lose weight, that doesn't mean it's without harm. Research consistently shows that fat shaming can actually increase the risk of weight gain. When you are constantly shamed, judged, and criticized, you literally experience stress in the body that increases cortisol, which we talked about here, increases belly fat storage and food cravings. People who experience weight bias are more likely to become obese, even if they were thin to start out with. And this shaming is also linked to depression, anxiety, low self-esteem, eating disorders, exercise avoidance, and healthcare avoidance. There are ways to support a loved one on a weight or health journey without shaming. And I'm just gonna give you a few ideas. For one, weight talk is super sensitive, so always be mindful of time and place. If your sister is going through a divorce, maybe now's not the best time to be talking about her weight gain. If you are in a group setting, like a holiday meal, definitely not appropriate to bring it up. Always ask before assuming they even wanna talk about it. If they do, start by listening, validating, and being curious, rather than just like jumping in with these immediate solutions like, oh, have you tried keto? Or, oh, you should do intermittent fasting, etc. If they're open, invite them to share their perspective and stage of readiness. So if they've gained weight and are now at risk of diabetes, ask them how they are feeling about the situation. Ask if there is anything you can do to support their goals. Going grocery shopping together, doing meal prep together, going for walks together, or choosing non-food activities for socializing are all ways that you can support without shaming. Positive reinforcement is wildly more successful than punishment at encouraging long-term behavior changes. And shaming is probably as punishing as it gets. Now, I wanna make it super clear that I am not promoting obesity. There are real health risks of living with excess fat, and for a lot of people, some of those risks could be greatly reduced with weight loss. But two things can be true. We can acknowledge that there are risks of obesity and risks of making people who are fat hate themselves. Like I believe in body autonomy. So if someone wants to lose weight, I support that choice. But we always need to evaluate the benefit of weight loss against the risks of particular ways of achieving said weight loss. So if you're looking for more gentle weight loss solutions to help without the high risk of harm, definitely check out my video right here. 
Bottom line, there are a lot more interesting insights from both sides in this video, and I'm so grateful that these different individuals from different walks of life were able to come together and have a respectful and civil conversation and share their lived experiences with the world. It is such a great piece of content, so definitely watch the whole thing. But as part of my community, I am going to expect the same respectful conversation here. So definitely keep it kind, watch the full video. I will link it below. And on that note, that's all that I have for you guys today. Give this video the thumbs up, sound off in the comments with your perspectives, and I will see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye.